Talk Radio 920 WHAJ. I'm Helen Glover. Congressman Ron Paul going to be speaking at URI tonight. Keeney Gym, 7 p.m. It's an on-campus town hall sponsored by URI Youth for Ron Paul. And he's stopping by making a visit on the Helen Glover Show today. Congressman Ron Paul, good morning. Good morning. Nice to be with you. And welcome to Rhode Island. And I don't know if you remember, but four years ago up in New Hampshire, you and I sat down at the primary up there and we had quite a discussion as well. So welcome back. I, I well, should say welcome thank you. back. Great to be with you. Now, you're at URI tonight, and I've been talking about this on the show today. Last time around, last presidential campaign, it was the college campuses all a buzz for President Obama, now, well, Senator Obama, then President Obama now. But you've got an amazing popularity amongst the kids on college campuses. How do you explain that? Mm-hmm. You know, I've tried to. I don't know for sure. There's a lot of different explanations, but the best I can say is young people are very open-minded to this whole issue of individual liberty and limited government, which pleases me to no end. But I talk about foreign policy. They don't seem to uh, think that it's worthwhile for them or their generation to continue this foreign adventurism and the wars that we've been involved in. They're very attracted to this idea of sound money and what uh, how the Federal Reserve has messed our monetary system up. And I think it's a personal liberty issue. I, I talk a whole lot about people owning their own lives and determining what's good or bad for themselves and and also assuming the responsibility for all their actions. And that message just seems to be well received. I tell you, I find it refreshing that young people are tuning into that because I think, you know, for four years ago, you were all, you were also sounding the alarm about the, you know, needing to monitor the Fed and the gold standard. You were talking about increasing debt, increasing the size of government. Now, all of a sudden, I mean, it was bad enough. The, you know, even Republicans disagreed with what George Bush was doing. <laughs> now we've got the government on steroids, $16 trillion in debt. And my own personal thought on that is people on the college campuses are realizing that they're the ones that are going to be paying that debt. That's right. And I think what's apparent now compared to four years ago is the failure of our system is is very clear. Uh, and it's not going to continue to work. You can't continue to do what you say, run up these, these deficits. The financial crisis has hit. We haven't gotten out of it like a weak recession. They talk about this as the Great Recession. But for the people who are unemployed, which is close to 20 percent, that's a depression. And also, the large majority of the American people now are saying that uh, the war doesn't make any sense and we ought to come home. So they see the failure of the monetary policy, the fiscal policy. They see the failure, you know, of the foreign policy. And the young people, like you say, they see that they're inheriting this. It's a, a, a bad policy as well as a huge debt, and there's no way that that responsibility should fall on their shoulders, and they have no idea how to pay for it because, quite frankly, they can't under these circumstances. You know, big headline today out of the Washington Times, Democrats once again punting on a Senate budget bill, third year in a row. I find that inexcusable. I think the the Senate is you know, taking a, a holiday here for the last three years. I'd like your thoughts on that. Well, there's a reason for that. There's the political reason they don't want to face up to it, but the practical reason is is uh, there's no constituency for really cutting. There's a lot, lot of constituency for talking, but uh, n- nobody really wants to cut, and so, so they think that it's only a budgetary issue. It, it, it's a little bit more than that. Um, if you can't touch any of the overseas spending, and that is sacred, then, then you're, you, you know, you're, we're missing something. So some people won't cut that, and others won't cut food stamps and entitlements. Uh, and it looks like we're going to march on to a destruction of the currency where this debt is liquidated through the devaluation of the currency. And that is dangerous because that can lead to political chaos. Yeah, but absolutely. right now, there's no consensus because they will not concede that we have to change our way of living and the whole concept of what our government's responsibility should be. And you thought we're talking with uh, Congressman Ron Paul. He's going to be at URI tonight, uh, 7 p.m. Keeney Gym, uh, sponsored by Youth for Ron Paul. Uh, Congressman Paul, the Senate the other day, too, brought up this uh, this Buffett rule. It was brought up by our own Senator uh, Whitehouse from Rhode Island. And it was, most people thought it was just political theater. It, it didn't pass. But what are your thoughts on the Buffett rule? How do you feel about, you know, going after the evil rich and, you know, millionaires and billionaires, making them pay more? Does that do anything to help pay down the deficit? No, if you just go after rich people and tax them, it, it won't touch the deficit, even though Obama, I think, admitted that. So it's sort of a vindictiveness. But the only way I would qualify that concern, and I do it in my speeches, is that some people are rich 
because they live off the system. You know, if, if you're a banker or a company that gets bailed out and you live off government contracts, that, that being rich under those circumstances, I don't have much sympathies for that. But if, if you're rich and you've done well because you provide a great service, you shouldn't be punished for this. So I like to distinguish the two. And right now, the people who are upset, rightfully so, for the people who got bailed out, they should not put everybody you know, in the same category. We should sort this out and only uh, – and you don't punish them by taxing the people who made money off the government. You, you should quit bailing them out and, and change the system where the entitlements flow to the very wealthy. Well, I absolutely agree with you on that one. I think this Buffett rule was uh, crazy, but they knew it wasn't going to pass. Right. You, you mentioned uh, you know, changing the tax code. What could be done? Do you think this is something that, I mean, I look at the tax code, it's, it's, it's so large. Most people don't understand it. It only seems to be getting bigger and bigger. What is the, the one thing that we could do or your thoughts on changing that tax code and making it you know, certainly, I, I'm all for fairness. I'm, I'm for everybody paying into the tax code. Yeah. Well, I'd like everybody to pay the same amount, but my goal is to make it zero because when our country was much smaller in a constitutional size before 1913, we didn't have an income. There's no reason why we shouldn't think about that, especially when we have to rebuild this society when this comes down on us. But the principle of the income tax is is very, very bad. The assumption is that the government owns everything that we make. And we're allowed to keep a certain percentage due to, the, you know, depending on their rules. Right. So I, I do everything I can to undermine uh, the power of the IRS and reduce taxes. But first, you've got to cut spending. Oh, I, absolutely. Now, you know, the GSA, the General Services Administration, uh, that's been in the news lately because of, uh, you know, they just the outrageous spending that went on. Uh, what government agencies under a Ron Paul administration would you close? I have listed listed five: energy and education, interior, commerce, uh, as well as HUD. You know, we we don't need those. They're not authorized under the Constitution. I want to cut a trillion dollars, but actually, even in that transition, I have not picked to choose. You know, to go after uh, Medicare and Medicaid and some of the services that we have taught so many people to depend on. I believe we could work our way out of it, but you can't do it without changing overall policy, and I certainly emphasize a whole lot about the drain of our resources and wars that are never won that just go on for year after year. Yesterday, the president came out, a speech in the Rose Garden, talking about uh, he's going to attempt to uh, at least influence Congress with $52 million, by the way, to bring down the price of gas. He wants to go after speculators. Is there anything a president can do to bring down the price of gas? Uh, or they could, uh, you know, change the rules so there's, uh, you know, more, uh, more uh, drilling and, 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 and more market activity. But uh, one thing they do, most people forget, is the interference with the production of energy does, you know, cut down on supply and pushes up prices. But also prices go up because the dollar goes down in value. When other people were saying, I can get gasoline prices down to 250 I said, I can get them down to a dime because the old silver dime is worth, uh, you know, about $3. So, so you, it's the value of the money that goes down. So that's part of the problem, and you really can't deal with any of the prices. If, you have, if, you, if the cost of medicine or education or housing or anything is involved, you can't ignore the monetary issue. You know, the president yesterday wants to go after the speculators, and, yeah. I, and I've been and I've been trying to, you know, a lot of this stuff gets over my head, <laughs> over my pay grade, as the president would have said. Right. Um, but he wants to go after the speculators. How much do speculators really affect the price of gas? Well, they, they affect it, but m- more in a positive way. They, they, people on the low end of the top end, uh, they're, they're you, you know, sorting out the market, so they serve a market function. Sometimes it gets out of control. Uh, because of the excess credit, and that that means that you know some of the so-called speculators in uh, housing prices pushed prices up so-called too high, but they were also reflecting reality because the cash was out there. But some of us could, have, you know, were able to recognize what this is an artificial uh, bubble. But speculating is, is very useful, and uh, they don't ever complain about the speculators who lose a ton. Everybody who 
uh, speculates on the high side and makes money. There's somebody on the low side speculating on the other side. But the two go back and forth, and that helps source out uh, the pricing structure. So uh, there's nothing basically wrong with speculating, Also, uh, but although it does reflect very often a deeply flawed monetary system. Um, let me ask you about uh, jobs and the economy, because that is, you know, number one uh, right here in Rhode Island and I would think around the rest of the country. But jobs or lack of jobs, that's that is the big issue. What can you do? What could a Ron Paul administration do to create jobs or at least get government out of the way so that the private sector could create jobs? What's what's the biggest thing? Well, the government does need to get out of the way. They need a better tax structure. They need to not tax savings. They need not tax capital. They shouldn't be taxing the return of capital of this country. We have to massively deregulate. Every time we have a problem, they increase regulation. Both parties have tend to do that. You have to straighten out the monetary system where you don't have the uh, half of the economy, which is the money side of the economy, being regulated by a monopoly and fixing the price of money. So it, you have to do all those things. But government could, should quit spending. You know, they should cut spending way back, and the people should be spending the money. Uh, but uh, the, uh, the, the other thing is... is uh, uh, the states also have responsibilities, too, because sometimes labor laws in individual states, the states that have had uh, labor laws that push the price of labor up artificially high, they are the ones who have lost the jobs, and uh, their, their population is shrinking. They're moving south. Uh, Texas picked up four new congressmen because people are moving from the Midwest and the Northeast. And the Northeast, absolutely. Their local laws. Absolutely. What, what do you think about a national right-to-work law? Is that something that uh, should be passed? Yes, and it seems strange because I'm against all this national, right? Yeah. You know, national laws. But the way that law is written, it's actually getting the government out of the way. It's 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 allowing, uh, you know, it's not giving labor artificial powers as it did in 1935 with the Wagner Act. So if you repeal things and you call it a national right to work law, it sounds like we're writing a new law. But what you're doing is deregulating the system and allowing the market to determine price of labor rather than artificial power given to uh, certain working groups. We're talking with Congressman Ron Paul running for president. He's going to be appearing uh, at URI tonight, part of the uh, Youth for Ron Paul. It's going to be Keeney Gym, 7 p.m. Um, Congressman Paul, you're, are you hoping to have some influence on the Republican platform? And what is one thing that you would want included in that platform? <clears throat> well, the best way to simplify that would be to make people aware of what the Constitution says. Just listen to the Constitution, read Article 1, Section 8. But that's a little oversimplistic for so many people. But if there's one item, uh, you know, if we had monetary reform, it would restrain the entitlement system and it would restrain the deficits run up by war. So uh, if as long as the Fed can monetize debt, uh, the, gov- the Congress will always spend too much. If, if all of a sudden the Fed couldn't buy Treasury debt, interest rates would go up and it would be damaging to the economy. And the only alternative would be for Congress to quit spending money. So monetary reform could affect both foreign policy and domestic entitlement system, and that is one of the reasons why I talk about monetary reform so much. And you intend to stay in until the, uh, until the convention, correct? That is my plan right now. And I know you've asked this before. I'm just going to ask again because I got a couple questions from uh, listeners here. You're not planning a run as an independent, correct? I have no plans to do that. Okay, that's what I thought. And also one of your one of your supporters here, Andy from South Kingstown, wants to know, would you consider Mitt Romney for a position in the Ron Paul administration? At the moment, no, <laughs> unless he changed his ways because we don't agree on too much. We, we're friendly and we get along fine, but our views aren't very similar. So, uh, you know, I've, I've enjoyed the conversation with you, Congressman Paul, and I know you're going to draw a large crowd tonight. My, my last question here, just because we ran it as a poll question on the show today. Yesterday, it looked like uh, we saw the end of the space program as the uh, shuttle discovery was taken to Washington, D.C. to become part of the Smithsonian now. Good move or bad move getting rid of the space program? Um, probably a good move, uh, some space exploration is good for national defense purposes, but just to have it because it's interesting, <clears throat> we can't afford that. And uh, this whole idea that we might go to Mars or the moon, I think that's a drain. Uh, I would think if we're a very, very wealthy society like we could be, 
it would be privatized and there'd be funds. It's already there's already people wanting to privatize space exploration. So that's where that's the direction I'd want to go. And last question for you, Congressman Paul. Uh, if Mitt Romney ends up being the nominee and is elected president, if offered, would you serve in that administration? And what would be the ideal position for you? I've, I've got my own favorite spots for you, but yeah, uh, just that, curious. It's it's really not going to happen, mainly because uh, my lack of enthusiasm for him to be in a cabinet of my mind would be probably his answer as as well. Uh, but um, uh, obviously, I've spent my most time, if it was in an advisory capacity or some sort, would be, have some influence on monetary policy. Yeah, I'd love to see a Secretary of uh, the Treasury, quite frankly. I think you'd do a better job than <laughs> I'd, Timothy I'd Geithner. I'd be stingy, you know. <laughs> <laughs> I know you would, but I think that's why you're popular on college campuses. Congressman Ron Paul is going to appear tonight. University of Rhode Island's Keeney Gym, 7 p.m., put on by the youth for Ron Paul. Congressman Paul, thank you very much. Enjoyed the uh, discussion. Thank you. Thanks so much. Uh, 9.53, quick break here on the Helen Glover Show. Right back with you on Talk Radio 920 WHJJ.